Before I get into my thoughts on Catwoman, I really want to shout out one of my favorite creators, Aishio. Aishio covered the legacy of Catwoman all the way back in 2022. Not only did she go deep into the film itself, but she also analyzed Halle Berry's tumultuous career, the Oscar curse, and the hypersexualization of women in action films. Because some of the elements in my video also tie into themes she went into, I want to give her credit because her video came first and also it's just really fucking good. Honestly, if you're not watching her stuff, I don't know what you're doing. Some of my favorite videos of hers also include her analysis of one of my favorite horror film series, Tales from the Hood, her video on Fast Color, and her video on The Last Holiday. But I cannot stress enough that she never misses and all of her videos are fantastic. I have linked her page in the description of this video, so please check her out. Now, when I announced this topic on my community channel, I was flooded with comments from people who have a strong admiration for this movie, people who love it dearly. One of the comments read, Catwoman is so good when you don't have an annoying bitch in your ear telling you it's bad. And guys, Sorry, but I'm about to be an annoying bitch. I mean, don't get me wrong, I do love this movie. It is entertainingly bad, iconically bad, and joyfully silly in a way that I just find super endearing. But I also hate this movie, and I'll get into all of the why throughout this hellish journey that I call a video. I feel like you don't need me to tell you that Catwoman 2004 is a terrible movie with very few redeeming qualities. Everything from top to bottom is kind of a disaster. The writing is horrid, the characters are undercooked, the story doesn't give you a whole lot to hold on to, and the score is not just unremarkable, but kind of distracting. The director, Pitoff, was eviscerated by the one and only Roger Ebert with one simple line at the end of Ebert's review for the film. The director, whose name is Pitoff, was probably issued with two names at birth and would be wise to use the other one in his next project. Me out. At this point, the disastrous result that is Catwoman is not only well documented, but also broadly discussed. I often make the mistake of referring to things as if everyone knows what I'm talking about. I have since learned that not everything I think is iconic is actually iconic. Still, I have to say, this is one of those stinkers that feels like common knowledge. It's a bit, dare I say, iconic and its failure. I'm sorry. We're living in an age now where superhero movies are being met with a bit of fatigue, especially last year, but I guess some of the fatigue is over because folks are really looking forward to Deadpool and Wolverine. No comment, but also lots of comments. But in 2004, when Catwoman stumbled its way into theaters, Hellboy blew audiences away when it premiered in April, followed by another stunning feature, Sam Raimi's highly anticipated Spider-Man 2, which hit theaters in June. So Catwoman was not only disappointing for comic book fans, but for fans of good movies who had been eased into a false sense of security and had high expectations after two back-to-back -back works of art. Though to be fair, those high expectations weren't long-lasting as this production had been troubled from the start. When the idea of a standalone Catwoman film was initially conceived, Tim Burton had been at the helm, having directed Batman Returns, which saw the debut of perhaps the most beloved iteration of Catwoman played by Michelle Pfeiffer. Just a year after the release of Batman Returns, Warner Brothers announced a spin-off in the summer of 1993. In the early days, both Pfeiffer and Burton were set to return, but this movie just didn't happen. At least not the movie that was initially envisioned by screenwriter Daniel Waters. Waters, who had written the script for Batman Returns, recalled having turned in his screenplay for Catwoman on the same day that Batman Forever, Joel Schumacher's cartoonish version of the comic, hit theaters. Waters had written a much darker world than what WB seemed willing to adapt to screen, so the script was shelved and the project was left in development hell until 2001 when we finally got an update. The film was going to be made, it was going to star Ashley Judd, and it was going to have an entirely new script from an entirely new set of screenwriters. When Ashley Judd dropped out of that project, prioritizing a chance to star in a Broadway production of Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. Isn't that kind of funny? Trading one cat for another. No? Okay, just me. Nicole Kidman and a few other actresses, most of them unnamed, were also considered. While you would think not having an actress would slow the production down again, Warner Brothers was in a bit of a rush to get the film released. <sighs> You see, they had a Batman v Superman film that was actually greenlit, set to start filming in 2003, and released in the summer of 2004, the same time slot that would eventually be given to Catwoman. For reasons that don't make sense because it's fucking WB, fuck WB, all my homies hate WB, they cancelled the highly anticipated Batman v Superman film and put themselves in the awkward position of having to rush production on another film in their lineup to replace what would have been the Batman v Superman release date. 
As it turned out, the cards fell to Catwoman, and they had a script, not the one Daniel Waters penned, which is actually really good, I'll link it in the description, but one written as a group project between John Brancato, Michael Ferris, and John Rogers. They had a $100 million budget, and they soon found a director in Pitoff. They just needed a Selena Kyle. Except, wait. They can't use Selena Kyle. A lot of fans were disappointed when the first trailer for Catwoman was released because it looked pretty bad. The CGI was especially abysmal, and keep in mind, all of this taking place during the early 2000s was no excuse for how it looked. We had already seen great visuals in the Lord of the Rings trilogy, Hellboy, Spider-Man 2, so going from effects like these to effects like this, it, it wasn't looking good for WB at all. But fans were also disappointed because... Who the fuck was Patience Phillips? According to one of the film's screenwriters, there was a legal nightmare that prevented them from using the name Selena Kyle. The most I can theorize is that the studio still thought that at some point they would be tying the character of Catwoman into future films, and maybe Pfeiffer was still contractually tied to the name Selena Kyle. Maybe it was too soon for that contract to run out, so they had no choice but to use a different name, except they did have a choice, and it was to simply not rush production. But then again, it's WB, thank you very much. This could have easily worked considering how many different Catwoman stories exist and because the movie also acknowledges the idea of there being multiple Catwomen throughout history, a detail that they spend four minutes showing in the opening montage but barely use in the story. And oh my god, imagine if we had used it, this would have been a Catwoman multiverse movie in 2004. To their credit, I think they did try by giving Julie Newmar, the first woman to play Catwoman, a role as Ophelia but turned it down because, well, she'd read the script. No other reason needed. That's actually the first reason I disliked Catwoman 2004 a little bit. We had an opportunity to put all the Catwomen together. Eartha Kitt was still alive. That would have been so cunty. Speaking of cunty, that's part of what makes this movie so good, in spite of, or maybe because of all of its flaws. Anyway, the studio has everything in place and they just need a Catwoman. Halle Berry was one of the highest paid actresses in Hollywood. Her performance in introducing Dorothy Dandridge won her an Emmy and a Golden Globe. In 2001, her performance in Monster's Ball became a critical darling, and with it, she became the first and still the only black woman to win the Academy Award for Best Leading Actress. The only one in 22 years, lord. In 2002, she played Jinx in the James Bond film Die Another Day. Because of Halle's growing popularity and the response to Jinx's character, there were conversations about making a Jinx spinoff. Though the idea was pitched to MGM by seasoned producers Barbara Bracoli and Michael G. Wilson, MGM shut the idea down. Barry, who had grown attached to the project in its pitching stage, was eager to helm an action blockbuster. And when Jinx fell through, well, there was Catwoman. Years later, Barry reflected on the decision to do the film after plans for Jinx fell apart. She told Variety magazine, Because I didn't do Jinx, I thought, this is a great chance for a woman of color to be a superhero. Why wouldn't I try this? So WB had their Catwoman, and it was a disaster. I struggle to find the words that would accurately describe the issue with Catwoman. It's not just that the movie is bad, I guess part of it is that it doesn't really feel like a movie even. If I had to compare it to anything, I'd say that Catwoman feels like you're watching a very vivid and detailed but rushed storyboard, a collection of images, a caption of action, and the semblance of a story but no real story to be found. It's almost as if the movie was shot with only a storyboard as the basis, like there was no script at all. But we know there was, because they had four writers. Because if there had been a script, we'd have a character to hold on to. A character with motivations, with flaws, with goals, with obstacles. Even though we know what Patience wants to do, which is find her killers, avenge her death, and stop Buleen beauty products from making people sick. I personally don't think we get enough moments with her to appreciate those goals existing as something she wants to do, as opposed to it feeling like the character is doing it because that's what's in the script. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. Patience is the idea of a character that was never fully fleshed out. Patience is the character I envisioned for stories I have not written but have made banger playlists for. She is an amalgamation of ideas that never gel together. And everything but the kitchen sink soup that relies on the origins and motivations of characters that came before her. And while I don't mean to suggest that there is anything wrong with being inspired by other stories, all stories are offshoots of other stories. Literally nothing is original and that's great. I mean you don't get a movie like Bottom 
comes from trying to be different. You get it when you grow up watching Bring It On, not another teen movie, but I'm a cheerleader in Fight Club. It's just that Catwoman is a story made by people who didn't understand Catwoman and weren't really given the time to even try. She's a little bit of The Crow. She's a little bit of Selena Kyle's Catwoman a la Batman Returns. She's a little bit of everything, which makes her a little bit of nothing. When there are so many influences thrown in so haphazardly, it's hard to get a grip on the character. Forgetting the story for a second, forgetting the ridiculous CGI and the hypersexualized costuming, Patience Phillips, bless her heart, is not a good character. We never get to see her split between her two existences, one as the meek Patience Phillips and the other as the bold Catwoman. We see those characters become one so quickly without the progression or tension that would make for an intriguing character study. And I wholeheartedly believe that the only reason anyone could say Patience is a good character is because she's played by Halle Berry. The writers didn't seem to know what Patience was beyond being initially meek, but the way Halle talks about the character, the way she talks about Patience becomes Catwoman. Oh my god, she talks about it with so much love and it's clear that she thought of backstory for Patience. She thought of all the things that the writers didn't and what she chose to sprinkle into her performance, that little sprinkle is a spark of Patience's potential. By the end of the movie, we hope we will present a character that has sort of learned how to control the duality of this new personality, which in turn makes for a well-rounded woman, which we all, I think, uh, strive to be. The way Halle talks about the film, she clearly had some great ideas. And that brings us to the second reason I kind of hate this movie. I feel like maybe if any of her suggestions were taken into account, they could have improved the story but no one was going to listen to an actor for hire. I just know some of you are rolling your eyes and saying that you don't need all of that for a superhero film, but we'll have to agree to disagree. Things like that, seeing the emotional stakes our characters are put through, is why Spider-Man 2 is one of the greatest superhero films of all time. In one of the many behind the scenes interviews for Catwoman, Halle Berry says, Her struggle is to come to terms with the duality of who she was and now who she's become. That right there, that sounds like a good movie. You don't need me to tell you that is not the movie we get. All that said, Hallie getting the bulk of the blame for how the movie turned out was and still is ridiculous considering that she was the only thing holding the movie together. So what's Catwoman about? A woman named Patience Phillips works as a graphic design artist for a big cosmetics company, Hedera Beauty. Patience is the human version of a doormat and has the worst fashion sense of anyone on earth. Sometimes these movies try to convince you that a character doesn't have fashion sense, but their outfits are actually fine. I will give this movie credit by saying this is one of those rare cases where the character does not have fashion sense and the clothes are actually really hideous and unflattering, so I think they, they got that down pat. Unfortunately, the worst part for me is that she ends up having to wear this awful outfit two days in a row because some genius decided to put the opening scene later in the movie. This scene where she meets Detective Tom Lone, that was supposed to be the opening scene. So when she's rushing out the door after Tom Lone saves her, and then we see her like rushing up the steps to work and she's like all frazzled and stuff, those were supposed to be together, but someone moved it and I don't know why. Anyway, when Patience has to redo an assignment to avoid losing her job, she has to go to a warehouse or something to drop it off before midnight. She walks in on a few lab scientists and the CEO's wife, Laura Hader, played by Sharon Stone, discussing the negative effect of their products. That's when patients overhears that their products cause horrible headaches and illnesses, but also destroys your face if you stop using it and turns it into stone if you keep using it. So patients gets found out. She has to run for her life. She gets killed. A bunch of cats around her. A fake cat breathes the air of meow into her body and she is reanimated. When she comes to, she has no recollection of what happened and she just goes back home. Ugh, this is one of the biggest issues I have with the movie because I'm someone who loves a good revenge story especially when there's enough buildup to it that leads to a satisfying payoff. I know Patience is checking people off her list, people who are involved with her death. Like, I, I can see that. I know she was looking for answers, but between the love story with Tom Lone and the focus on Buleen and Laurel Hedare, her investigations get cut short and end up being pretty rushed. Following the night of her death, she doesn't seem that concerned with what happened. And I know she has no memory of what happened, but considering that a large chunk of her memory is missing, I wish we had seen her express more concern, but the concern for her missing memories 
is overshadowed by her sudden cat-like behavior. Several points for the cat-like behavior though, because you know why. I wish we had seen her reflecting more over her missing memories though. I wish we saw more of her actively trying to fill the gaps and do a proper red string investigation. Again, I know she's investigating, but the nerd in me wants more. Give me the red string. Give me that aha light bulb moment when she realizes who she's looking for. In the words of Britney Spears, gimme, gimme more. Gimme more. Gimme, gimme more. I think Patience thoroughly investigating her own death would have also made Tom Lone's appearance less of a shoehorned inconvenience because maybe she could start to use him and his connections to answer her burning questions about those lost memories. Anyway, I would never call Tom Lone's appearance a shoehorned inconvenience though because I respect Benjamin Bratt, but come on, it was a shoehorned inconvenience for the sake of giving Catwoman a love interest even though she didn't really need one. But hey, when they look this good together, who's complaining? Oh, but speaking of Catwoman having a love interest and being independent, I just want to show this clip of this interviewer asking Halle Berry about Catwoman's independence and if it meant Halle Berry herself hated men. This movie, Catwoman's very independent by the end. She decides that maybe she doesn't need to have the man next to her all the time. You're obviously, you've made some comments in public about that yourself. Are you? but you're still pretty man friendly, right? The 2000s, baby. While Patience is having fun with Tom, Laurel Hedera is having a rough time at home and at the company she helped to build. Laurel's been the face of Hedera Beauty since it started, but now that she's hit 40, her husband has ousted her and replaced her with a younger model, one who is apparently not even old enough to drink. Here is the seed of a really great idea, a really profound idea, especially for the 2000s, that this movie, absolutely squanders. Laurel is the antagonist of the story. She presents a few obstacles for patients, even frames her for two murders. Still, there isn't enough between them for us to get the sense that they are going against each other actively. In any story, a protagonist has their goals, and the antagonist's goals are often in complete opposition of the protagonist's goals. The problem with Catwoman is that for most of the movie, these two are on the same pages of two completely different books. Usually, you'll see a sort of parallel between the narrative of the protagonist and the narrative of the antagonist. In theory, Patience's initial goal of having to solve her own murder, clear Catwoman's name, and get revenge should be interfered by Laurel's goal to keep the murders under wraps, pin it all on Catwoman, and getting away with everything. But because the movie is so confused about Patience, it's also confused about her goals. Sometimes her goal is to stop Hedera, but sometimes it's just to stop jewelry thieves so she can steal the jewelry, only to return most of it. Also sorry, but why do they treat Patience's cat abilities like a werewolf? A werecat? This is not a story about the duality of Patience being herself and also being Catwoman. This is a story about being a werecat and not having any memory of what you do during the night, apparently. Even though the movie is majorly confused about Patience's goals, there is one parallel between Laurel and Patience that I think had major potential. Remember when I said how from B Patience stresses in the beginning of the film? Unflattering cuts, unflattering fits, color schemes that don't always mesh well? But she's still a very beautiful woman, maybe one who doesn't recognize her own beauty or even her own sexuality. What we see begin to happen after she adopts cat-like abilities is that Patience becomes more confident, no longer hiding behind her clothes or hiding behind her hair. She even feels bold enough to wear makeup. While Patience is coming into expressing her sexuality and recognizing her own beauty, Laurel is beginning to question hers and her place in society after being so easily discarded. See, I've always seen Catwoman as a sort of weird, campy, almost but not quite version of Snow White. Maybe I thought this because at nine years old I was obsessed with this movie and I had seen it way too many times. Or maybe I thought this because I was nine years old and my only other points of reference in pop culture were like Courage the Cowardly Dog, DCOMs, and animated Disney films like Snow White. Snow White is a story that's all about beauty and the role that women play in society. There's a slight reflection of Snow White and Catwoman, with Laurel Hedera obviously being the evil queen and Patience being a more morally gray version of Snow White. All eyes are on Catwoman. She's the fairest in the land. Eyes weren't on Patience, but they are on Catwoman. She's so attractive. She's still youthful, so the world has a place for her. Hot, black leather, whip. But Laurel is realizing that the older she gets, the more invisible she becomes, and invisibility is actually a feeling that Patience theoretically knows all too well. Ugliness 
aging, and the price of beauty is certainly a theme the story could have explored, and I think may have wanted to explore more, but whatever depth could have been achieved from those themes is more akin to a kiddie pool than to an ocean. It would also be a tough theme for the film to explore considering how hell-bent it is on making Hallie's sex appeal the centerpiece of the film. Trust me, I know how silly that sounds, because you can't really have a story about Catwoman without sex appeal being part of her character. You simply can't have a story about Catwoman where Catwoman isn't sexy. Like, that's kind of her whole thing. Not only is she quick-witted with great reflexes, but she's a seductress who uses her charm to lull people into a false sense of security so she can get what she really wants. Sex and Catwoman, well, they kind of go hand in hand. But Halle's version of Catwoman, and this may be a controversial opinion, is almost drained of sex appeal mainly because her sexuality is kind of limited. For instance, due to the film's PG-13 rating, we can't realistically get a sex scene between Tom and Patience, but the film does allude that they sleep together, and Tom wakes up with a scratch in his back. Patience is clearly adventurous in bed, maybe even more dominant, which means she knows what she wants and she has no problem going for it. Even as Patience, she has this in her, not as Catwoman. But the writers were so intent on making sure Patience was still their definition of a good, pious person, so even when it comes to kissing, she's almost shy and reserved about it. You could argue that this is just Patience pre-Catwoman coming through, and that's fair, but that also points to another problem. The story doesn't follow too much of the duality Patience is experiencing. Her characterization as Catwoman is almost like a light switch. She turns it off and turns it on depending on who she needs to be in any given moment. The way Patience is written, she doesn't always seem in control of her sexuality. Combining that with the way she is filmed and photographed, it starts to feel more like the cameraman being leery than Patience herself taking charge of her sexuality. There's a very thin line between sexual empowerment and hypersexualization, and sometimes it's difficult to tell the difference between the two. I find the camera's gaze on Hallie's body to be on the more uncomfortable side, and I've thought about why. Like I said, Catwoman doesn't exist outside of that sexualized space, and I respect that. She's hot, she's kinky, I want her to stay that way, okay? So why does Hallie's version feel different to me? I had to sort of investigate for myself there, and I realize it's because I'm looking at it from a perspective that's taking into account all the ways Halle Berry has been treated in the industry. So this may not be a flaw of the film itself. It's just something I'm bringing into my viewing of it. When I see shots like these, of course I think that Halle is just hot, but I also think of how vitriolic people were toward her when Monsters Ball was released, for example. For those who don't know, there's a controversial sex scene in that movie due to the fact that the character Halle Berry's character sleeps with is a racist. I unpack Monsters Ball and the culture around it in a Patreon exclusive video if you want to hear more. But Halle's performance, the significance of it, all of it was reduced to that sex scene. Monsters Ball ended up being one of the most rented movies of 2002 because people wanted to watch the sex scene. So when I hear the costume designer for Catwoman say that the end goal was just to show as much skin as possible. We were reluctant to give her a head to toe bodysuit, so it was all about showing as much skin as possible. I think about how the infamous Oscar slap wasn't even the first time someone was assaulted on the Oscar stage, but it was the first time there was an uproar about it. I think about how Adrian Brody, after winning his award, famously grabbed Halle Berry and kissed her without consent. I think about how disturbing this had been for Halle. And and how people still laughed, and Adrian Brody, decades later, could say that he doesn't regret it. So no, Patience's sexualization isn't a problem in and of itself, but when I think of it in tandem with Halle Berry's treatment, yeah, I, I get a little ticked off. I also find it a bit depressing that in so many action films starring women, their sexuality is often framed to be the most important thing about them. Like, Halle's Catwoman costume is amazing in its own right, but as far as practicality, it also just wouldn't work for a woman fighting bad guys and who is hell-bent on revenge. Her entire back is exposed. If someone wanted to stab her, they would have no problem doing so because she has no armor. On that note, I'd also have loved for the story to have explored the possibility of her not needing armor, or even her taking on this newfound fearlessness of death after literally dying. But again, I think I'm asking too much of this movie. I do wish sometimes that women in action films didn't also have the pressure of being sexy all the time, but it's complicated. On one hand, I like to see women kicking ass and being hot. There's nothing wrong with being a sexy badass. But on the other hand, a lot of these movies, especially in the early 2000s, were made with a male gaze in mind, so it doesn't really feel like the women embracing their sexuality as much as it feels like the reductive feminist idea that sex is the most important part of female liberation. For some of these movies, the sexuality of its subjects feels less like the characters being unapologetic about their sexuality and more like the male creators using their sex appeal to undercut their 
agency. Like, yes, she's a no-nonsense, independent, gun-toting woman, but also her tits are huge and that's pleasing to me. It kind of reminds me of when the internet decided to just put Brie Larson through absolute hell. Many trolls would make fun of Brie's body and how unsexy they found it, how they couldn't take her seriously, as if her sexiness while playing a superhero was the most important thing about that superhero. Forget power, forget saving the world, how well does your ass fill out your suit? To quote researcher and writer Wendy Ahrens, who penned in an essay for real knockouts, violent women in the movies, the focus on the female body does mitigate the threat that women pose to the very fabric of society by reassuring the male viewer of his privilege as the possessor of the objectifying gaze. But you can tell that the studio behind Catwoman didn't want to write a better story. The director Pitoff apparently had a more experimental, more artistic vision for the film that was shot down. A script doctor was hired to rewrite it, but they weren't given enough time to fix all of the story's flaws because once again, say it with me, WB sucks. So they relied on Halle Berry's sex appeal instead of Catwoman's sensuality, instead of Catwoman's agency even. And this is where I really have to give it to Halle. Like she famously won a Razzie for her performance in this film. And I feel like no one recognized that she was really the only thing holding it together or trying to hold it together. And to this day, Barry is proud of what she did on Catwoman. And I personally think she deserves to be. Whether you like the film or not, her take on Catwoman became iconic for the girls and the gays because say it with me, it's Conti. It was iconic for me as a little black girl seeing her on screen for the first time, and it's since become a camp classic that's well appreciated in queer communities, and all of that is just because of how Hallie played it. Aisha put it well in her video when she stated that the failure of the movie fell directly on the shoulders of Hallie, and that seems to be the position that black leads are put in all the time. Recently, Disney really tried their best to pin the failure of the Marvel squarely on the shoulders of Nia DaCosta, and I shit you not, I'm still terrified that DaCosta's career could be stalled because of this. I really hope that doesn't happen, but time and time again, I have seen it happen. For example, Ernest Dickerson, the director of Juice, had one film that didn't do well and he was written off in Hollywood for a long time. For black creatives, it seems excellence truly is the only way to go. One mishap and it all goes poof. Halle Berry coming off the high of her Oscar win and having her small role as Storm in the X-Men franchise expanded by a hair and a half was hopeful for the future of the industry. She had hoped she'd opened a door for black women as superhero leads or in action films, so the failure of this movie and the way Hollywood treated her afterwards had to have been devastating in more ways than one. And then, over 20 years after her historic Oscar win, she's still the only black woman to have won the award. A fact that seems to haunt her. This moment is so much bigger than me. And it's for every nameless, faceless woman of color that now has a chance because this door tonight has been opened. Robert Redford was saying how in a week or so people will kind of forget except the people that win and those close to them. Your case is different. Mm. You made history tonight. Mm. People will always remember you. How does that make you feel? Indescribable. That when I said the door tonight has been opened, I believe that with every bone in my body that this was going to incite change because this door, this barrier had been broken. And to sit here almost 15 years later and knowing that another woman of color has not walked through that door is heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking because I thought that moment was bigger than me. And it, it's heartbreaking to start to think maybe it wasn't bigger than me. Well, Maybe it wasn't and I so desperately felt like it was. The most egregious, bald-faced lie I've seen perpetuated too often in my research for the history of Catwoman is that the failure of this movie is essentially what prevented female-led action films from being made all the way up until The Hunger Games in 2012. This is the worst lie and it is pure erasure of other bad movies that I love, like I in Flux, Ultraviolet, Electra, like how embarrassing for you. So I'm here to say no. This movie was a critical and commercial failure. It kind of stalled the box office success of Halle Berry's career and to this day, film bros like to act as if it is the most egregious thing ever committed to film. Calm the fuck down, first of all. Second of all, 
Let's not act like the diminishment of women-led action films can all be blamed on Catwoman. Sure, let's ignore decades of sexism in the industry. Let's ignore that the resurgence of action movies in the form of superhero fantasy was mostly led by men, and every time a woman had a more significant role, it was met with some form of pushback. But more importantly, let's ignore the commercial success of movies like Resident Evil. Underworld, and the first Lara, Lara Croft, Croft film. The second one barely made its money back, but it also wasn't a complete disaster either, so it doesn't matter, we're not talking about it. What a lot of pop culture historians, I cannot believe I just said that, miss about the Catwoman debacle is that it didn't stop women-led action films from being made. There's a very blatant misunderstanding and erasure that happens when people say it like that, I want to be clear. What the failure of Catwoman did was stop the production of action blockbusters led by black women specifically. Keep in mind that Hollywood already thought financing a big budget action film helmed by a half black woman was too much of a risk. That's the whole reason that talks of a Jinx movie spinoff fell through. Aside from the action movies of the black exploitation era, which saw many, many black women being, I'm just gonna say it, badass. I mean, Pam Greer pulled a gun out of her afro. That's a level of iconic that I can barely comprehend. But the moment of black exploitation was just that, a moment that quickly faded when studios and guerrilla filmmakers no longer saw it as financially viable. Fast forward to the early 2000s and no one saw Jinx as being financially viable. The failure of Catwoman was a devastating blow for anyone wanting to make a different kind of action film because it confirmed what the thinking in Hollywood was at the time. No one wants to see a black woman lead an action film. It is not financially viable. And that leads me to another reason why I have a love-hate relationship with this movie. It was, and still so far is, the only standalone Catwoman film with a black woman in the lead, and I feel like the studio gave up on it before it even got off the ground. That's why my feelings on this movie are so messy. I appreciate what it is, but I also miss what it could have been, and I think Hallie deserved a better vehicle. Not only that, but she deserved to have several leading opportunities after this one failed. So Ryan Reynolds can do it, but Halle Berry can't? Okay. I don't think we even saw another action movie led by a black woman until 2018. 14 years after the Catwoman failure. And in 2022, the film equivalent of a solar eclipse happened. We got two action movies led by black women, The Woman King and the follow-up to the cultural juggernaut, Black Panther. Wakanda forever. Both these movies did well financially and critically, and I have my own thoughts about them, but that's beside the point. The point I want to make is that too often the work and the careers of black women in every industry, but in this case specifically in Hollywood, are overlooked and completely ignored. When Jennifer Lawrence had an interview with Viola Davis for a Variety magazine, she recalled how her career started to blossom with the Hunger Games series and was quoted as saying, I remember when I was doing Hunger Games, nobody had ever put a woman in the lead of an action movie because it wouldn't work, because we were told girls and boys can both identify with a male lead, but boys cannot identify with a female lead. Lawrence would later recant her statement and clarify what she meant after being called out. After dismissing not only Linda Hamilton and Sigourney Weaver, but also ignoring Pam Greer, Tamara Dobson, Vanetta McGee, the black women who did hand-to-hand -hand combat, jumped out of cars, and handled machine guns in black exploitation films. Lawrence's guffaw was bad, but nowhere near as bad as Elizabeth Banks' dismissal of black women. In her acceptance speech for the Crystal Award, Banks famously called out Steven Spielberg. I got, I ha went to Indiana Jones and Jaws and every movie that Steven Spielberg Spielberg's ever made, and by the way, he's never made a movie with a female lead. Sorry, Steven. I don't mean to call your ass out, but it's true. Except, oh, right. Spielberg did The Color Purple, a movie starring Whoopi Goldberg as the lead. The most financially successful movie starring black women in a long time, and I, I think it was the most successful until at least Wakanda Forever. Someone correct me on that if I'm wrong. I would have loved to see Patience be her own character with her own motivations. I would have loved if the mystery of her trying to solve her own murder felt more coherent and more satisfying. I wish the movie also had an R rating because A, I wanted to see more of the people she killed in Vengeance getting fucked up. 
And because B, this movie partly wants to be about patients exploring her sexuality, but she can't freely do that with a limited PG-13 rating. That's just, you know, the times, I guess it was the time. Ultimately, I think Halle Berry is right to be proud of it and proud of the work she did. How would you rate the film Catwoman? You're asking me? Yes. A hundred. A hundred! <laughs> but I also wish there was more for us to hold on to with this character. And um, part of me kind of hopes I get to see her again. Maybe she'll be written with a little more love. There are a lot of things that could have been done that would have made this movie better, but I also recognize that if some of those things were done, it wouldn't be the Catwoman that so many of us have come to love. I think there's space to appreciate the ridiculous, hell of a ride film that this is, and to also want more for us, to have wanted more for Halle Berry. But I guess that's what makes this film's legacy so complicated after all. And not just complicated, but cunty. Like my nails. As always, thank you for watching. Fun fact, I almost gave up on this video. I posted a rough cut of it last month, and when I had finished with the rough cut, I was just like, this is not at all what I thought it was going to be, and I was really like hard on myself about it. But then, you know, I took some time away from it and kind of for let myself forget about it for a little bit, and then I found out how to say some of the things I wanted to say, and yeah, so now it's finally here. So thank you for your patience. And speaking of patience, thank you to my patrons who are endlessly patient with me. The main reason I'm able to keep making videos because everything right now has been kind of uncertain. So thank you to them and thank you for watching.